Menopause is not just a cessation of your period, but there are other parts of the the system, the anatomy and the functioning of a woman's body that changes. So let's just start off for the listeners defining what menopause is and specifically how this is a neurologically mediated event. Well, you said it beautifully, so I can only expand on that a little bit. But I think as a society, we have missed about half of what menopause actually is. So we are told that menopause signals the cessation and the end of a woman's fertility, which I think is a terrible way to frame anything, really. But the idea is that the ovaries stop producing certain hormones and therefore eventually menstruation ends. And so it does a woman's childbearing potential, which is also a terrible terminology, but I will take it. I think what's missing from the conversation is that menopause is not only a reproductive event, but is really a systemic phenomenon that impacts a woman's entire body, especially her brain. And the vast majority, majority of research on menopause has neglected women's brains, and the vast majority of research really neglects women's brain health as a whole. And we're working to reframe this and clarify that menopause is a neuroendocrine transition state. So it's a change that impacts your brain, your neurological system, and your hormones, your endocrine system. And both these systems work together. They are very coordinated throughout a woman's entire reproductive span and reproductive life. And they also still communicate after menopause, which is something that many people don't realize. The ovaries don't shut down for good. They just make less of specific hormones, but they're not dead. We're not losing the functionality of the ovaries, just changing. And the, the relationship between the ovaries and the brain is also changing in ways that we, I believe, we're just starting to really gather real data about. So beautifully said. And I think one of the things I will always rally against, and you just mentioned it, is that menopause is often looked like it's a loss of something. It's a loss of fertility. It's a loss of our reproductive capacity. Uh, And as we'll talk about today, there are also, I mean, there's some remodeling that happens in the brain, but it's not a bad thing. And, And you argue very succinctly in the book that there's actually a gain of function, which we're, which we're going to get to. You talk about this idea, and you just mentioned it, this idea of bikini medicine, right? So I've never actually heard this term before, and I really appreciated it because it's just essentially looking at all the parts that would be covered up by a bikini, right? So you just only look at the ovaries that we've mentioned, or you look at the breasts, let's say, but everything else in women's medicine is sort of pushed off to the side, swept under the rug or ignored entirely. And there was a stat in your, in the book, which I'll just read briefly, fewer than one in five. So not one in five, but fewer than one in five OBGYN residents receive formal training in menopause medicine. And perhaps unsurprisingly, 75% of women who seek care for menopausal symptoms end up not receiving treatment, which is a sad state of affairs. And I, my hope is that your work and others like you will be changing the sort of demystifying and destigmatizing what menopause actually is and how we can support our beautiful women as they're going through this transition. So let's talk a little bit about some of the symptoms of menopause. We've talked about this idea that it is a neuroendocrine change. And maybe we can talk about Menopause is like one day in your life. It's like the one day that you qualify for the diet. It's a retroactive diagnosis. You got to go 12 months without a period. Then you get, you. it's that one day and then you're menopausal. And then that's kind of, you know, that's it. Then you're postmenopausal. But let's talk about some of the symptoms, clinical signs and symptoms that a woman might experience in the years leading up to menopause. We talk about this as perimenopause, what she might experience, and then how those also might be neurologically mediated Yeah, like you said, from a clinical perspective, menopause is defined as that one day on the calendar, which I find to be a puzzling definition that is also very confusing to many, many patients because any woman can tell you, right, that menopause does not happen overnight, but is a process that biologically and neurologically spans many, many years. So what I think is important to realize is that 
biology works on a continuum. And clinically, we're driven to try and categorize specific life events as isolated facts, losing the fact that all these things don't just happen in isolation, but they're part of a process. And at the end, that is very confusing to many, many women. Many of our patients will come to us and we'll be like, okay, so do you think you're perimenopausal, postmenopausal, almost menopausal? And they're like, I have absolutely no clue. Like, I, I, I can't quite tell you because, and then they start telling us and they show up with their calendars and say, you know, my last period, but then I skipped three months and then I had it again. And then I was nothing for 11 months. And then I had one more. What am I? You tell me. So I think that the approach to menopause needs to become as rich as the experience, in fact, is. And the tools that we have are not as efficient. So I would propose the revised framework for menopause that starts prior to that day on the calendar that is so actually difficult to pinpoint for many, many women. And we will start during a reproductive life or the premenopausal stage, which is when we have a regular menstrual cycle. And some women never have a regular menstrual cycle, right? So it's really case by case. But let's say on average, most women have a menstrual cycle every month. At some point, this changes. And this is when we approach the late premenopausal stage, which is when your cycle may be a little bit shorter, a little bit longer, a little bit lighter, a little bit heavier. And already at that stage, which is usually in the early mid 40s, that change, those light changes can effectively impact a woman's cognitive health, mental health, her mood, her sleep, her appetite, her stress levels. We have so many participants and patients who are late premenopausal who come to us because they can't sleep or they're having these supremely intense stress reactions that they can't quiet that they themselves characterize as being out of proportion. Like, I don't know why I got so mad or so upset. I felt like almost ragey. I just want to strangle that person where I'm usually so calm. That can happen. And it is a little bit of a prelude to the actual menopause transition, which starts afterwards. So when your cycle is no longer monthly, but starts skipping. And the first is just one month then it could be two months, then it could be again one month. This is the early perimenopausal stage. They're still quite transitional. But then the cycle really starts keeping several months at a time. And when it's more than six months apart, that is the late perimenopausal stage. And that is usually the toughest part of the entire transition. So it's not the postmenopausal phase, it's not after the last menstrual period, but it's, it's those four to eight years, sometimes two years, that lead up to the final menstrual period. It's really like a roller coaster ride for many, many women. And then is when we, brain people, brain scientists, and brain doctors, usually are being called upon for support because it's not just the hot flushes, it's not just the night sweats, but there is proper brain fog. There is mental fatigue, there is anxiety, inexplicable anxiety, there is depression, there's irritability, there's all sorts of reduced focus. The reduced ability to multitask is what most women come to, come to us with, having a concern about, and also fluency, the tip on the tongue phenomenon. Like I could not complete my sentence or I could not come up with words. I, one, one of our patients was like, I was in the middle of a meeting giving a presentation and just, I just could not speak. It's like my brain just jammed and I could not come up with words. And this is terrifying. It really can be upsetting to say the least and terrifying to the point that so many women are really concerned that they might be experiencing early onset dementia. And they come to us in a panic looking for counseling. And so we, we really help 
in that respect. And that brings us to the final menstrual period. Now, what happens is that, let's say you have your period and then that's it for about 11 months or 12 months. That is still considered perimenopause until we're sure you're not going to have any more periods in your life. At that point, we're able to say, okay, you're effectively in the postmenopausal stage. And that stage is also divided into an early stage and the later stage. And the early stage lasts about six years on average. And the symptoms are still quite active. The brain symptoms are active at that point. But then for many women, there's a little bit of a recovery. There's a plateau. There's a stabilization. And usually the symptoms go away over time. So that is the late postmenopausal stage. When that starts happening, it's a sign the transition has effectively ended or, or is almost complete. So this entire remodeling that starts in the ovaries and the brain at the same time effectively ends during the late postmenopausal stage for many women. The timeline is variable. For some women, it happens que fairly quickly. For some women, it can take decades. And there's no framework in medicine that really legitimizes and capitalizes on these observations. So I think that we really need to switch to an approach that takes women's experiences into account and try to understand a little bit better why is it that some women can transition very quickly and maybe have no symptoms at all, right? This lucky 5% of women who don't feel any sort of neurological or psychiatric, psychological discomfort. And some women really have a really hard time for many, many years to the point of being almost suicidal. So there's a whole range of symptoms and severity of symptoms and number of symptoms. Some women just have a couple of symptoms and women have them all. And this is not recognized in medicine and there are no treatments that are really targeted towards these different individual experiences. So I think there's a lot that needs to get done. And I think that brain people really should be involved in the conversation, in at least in some respect. Oh, absolutely. And it's it's heartbreaking. Okay, <laughs> it's, I mean, it's heartbreaking to, you know, to think about so many women, all the women that have come before us who have been told it's all in your head. It's just, that's what happens when you age, you know, suck it up buttercup. And one of the, you know, one of the, one of the things I think is really important for, for this conversation and for all future conversations around menopause is to tell women what is down the line potentially for them so that they don't misinterpret their experience once they're there. So if they are, they have that tip of the tongue, you know, that, or maybe it's consonant confusion or, you know, whatever, whatever it is. And they're like, I have the word in my brain, but I can't get my mouth. I can't get it to my mouth or the brain fog or the fatigue or the anxiety, some of the symptoms that you were just describing, so that when they are experiencing some of those things, they themselves are able to identify that this might be the, you know, the perimenopausal or that post those early postmenopausal years where we're seeing some of this neurological remodeling so that they don't think that they're crazy. Yes, I, it's really, I think it's the, the best part of our work is that we've been able to really prove what women have been saying for centuries, that menopause changes your brain. It really has an impact on your brain functionality, on your brain chemistry, even on the connectivity in the very structure of your brain. All these neurologically active phases have an impact on the brain that's been overlooked and really downplayed for decades. Because in neuroscience, which in my, my degrees are in neuroscience and nuclear medicine, so I've been struggling with this for a really long time, there's, this, there's a very persistent sense and conviction that sex does not matter. And when I say sex, I mean chromosomal sex. Yes. But they really have no bearing on the brain. That the men's brains and women's brains are exactly the same, except, you know, there's some ovaries in there. And that is really not the case. And there's a lot of research, emerging research mostly, showing that that is completely wrong and is dismissive and is reductive. And it's what led to be the bikini medicine approach you mentioned before, where historically, 
medical professionals and scientists really believed that women were essentially smaller men with different reproductive organs and that whatever differences between the genders pretty much ended there, which is to say that according to medicine, what makes a woman a woman is those organs and body parts that we can fit under a bikini and nothing more which is an extremely reductive understanding of what a woman is to start with, right? Not just culturally, but also really biologically or genetically. So we're trying to really change that and provide women with the information that they need to better understand themselves as they go through menopause, before and after menopause, right? Because it's really key, understanding what happens to you before and after menopause is really key, I think, to also understanding yourself before and after. Because many, many women report not just physical changes or maybe changes in their psychology and whatnot, but also changes in personality, changes in their life contentment, changing, changes in their priorities. And menopause really seems to be a little bit of a trigger for some sort of renaissance in, in women's brain health and women's health overall. For some women, there's the symptoms and going through menopause is a little bit of a, you know, it's a walk through fire and it may be extremely hard. But the vast majority of women reports emerging from this transition, feeling stronger, more capable, more resilient, more in tune with their own bodies, and also much more interested in what they want and what they care about, and much less concerned with what everybody else wants out of us. And I think that that's a beautiful way to think about any transition state, like puberty, pregnancy, menopause. They all have this, this concept in common that there's vulnerability, which is obvious, but there's also resilience, and there's a purpose. They don't happen by accident. There's a reason that our brains change together with the rest of our bodies. And I think this is really the beauty of this line of work is that we can see the pros and not just the cons and then get a better sense of the whole picture. And my hope as well is, you know, you mentioned that for, I think it's still the case today where often women are looked at as smaller versions of men with pesky ovaries and hormones and we're just smaller archetypes. And it, it does leave the door open. You, you talk in the book about neurosexism. It, it sort of, the, it leaves this thing, th this sort of door open for, oh, well, it's just like this quirk that she has. Like she's depressed. She's yeah. anxious. She's yeah. a difficult person. There's that, it opens the door for labeling, inappropriate labeling of the woman. And I think that as more clinicians, scientists, doctors understand, at, you know, as we're talking about that, this is a neuroendocrine portal, right? It's like a neuroendocrine change. And then on the other side, as you were talking about, which I definitely want to spend a little bit of time on, it's not, you know, we haven't lost something, but there's actually a maturation and there's a change as now we move into a different phase of our life, different responsibilities, different productivities, etc. that we're actually yeah. better off going through them.